Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very, 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 very excited because we have a very special guest. It is John Julia. He is one of the founders of Pinnacle AI, and he is here to talk about his uh, Pinnacle AI and about uh, into about AI itself and all the benefits that him and his company have to offer and to explain a little about AI and what's going on and what to understand the importance of AI. So, um, John, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure, Stacy. First, I want to thank you for having me on, right? It's obviously an honor and privilege to be talking with you this afternoon. So again, as you pointed out, uh, I'm John Julie. I'm Senior Vice President of Sale for Pinnacle AI. Um, you know, at Pinnacle AI, our mission, right, is to essentially use artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to modernize and optimize business processes, functions, uh, and, 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 and services, right, for, again, the business community. Uh, we typically target, right, that mid-market, but a lot of our solutions really kind of transcend industry vertical, industry, you know, company size, so forth like that. Now, AI is, you know, it has exploded and people don't realize that AI has been around for decades. You know, we we have had um, a gentleman by the name of Mark who has come on the show and he was actually one of the creators of AI uh, many decades ago when they started with the military. So, you know, people have just started to learn about AI in the last couple of years because it's been brought out into, you know, our social media and people are talking about it and programs are coming out. Um, but people don't really know that it actually started decades ago and there's so much potential that people don't understand how it could actually help to grow businesses and not just by graphs and content on the website, but it goes very deeper than that. And maybe you can explain how powerful AI is and how it could actually elevate and grow businesses, both corporation wise and small businesses also, if it's used in the proper way. And you guys do it in a very unique way other than other AI. AI program. So why don't you tell everybody a little about that? Absolutely, uh, Stacey. And that's a great point. Um, you know, thanks to uh, OpenAI, right, and the release of, at that time, right, a year and a half ago, ChatGPT3, uh, um, AI was really brought to the kind of the forefront of, uh, of, the, of the masses. But to your point, Artificial intelligence, machine learning actually dates back to the 50s, right? Yeah. I believe the first application on machine learning was uh, a machine playing a game of chess, yeah. right? And and certainly we, you know, we, we you know, have all watched war games, right? Where, you know, where Matthew Broderick, right, is, is trying to teach a machine, right, to learn that, you know, nuclear war, right? No, nobody wins very much like tic-tac-toe. Uh, so, so, so the technology has been around for a while. What's changed, Stacey, is that over the past couple of years, the way that artificial intelligence is deployed has really changed. So there's been a couple of events, right? N number one, the creation of what we call foundation models, right, or algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the deployment of machine learning uh, previous to a couple of years ago um, was really more like data science, right, where every data set had to have a value. And uh, the training of that data had to be had to be supervised from start to finish. Right. Well, in the advent of the foundation model, that really allows for what we call unsupervised unsupervised training. Right. That that the machine can start training the data without necessarily human intervention after those models have essentially been built out. Uh, so that's been a major uh, evolution so to speak, in artificial intelligence. Because prior, only the, the largest of the largest companies could have teams of data scientists, right? Paying yeah. 300 $350 an hour for. The other thing that has changed significantly is that the, the, the chips, right? Um, and the chip manufacturers, the cost of the chips um, has dropped significantly along with the ability of processing power the massive amounts of data sets, right, that can be processed simultaneously has exploded, right, over the past couple of years. So when you start to put those, when you start to put those events together, uh, that you can now build models that allow for unsupervised training of data, 
Uh, the fact that these models are now readily available, right, to right to the rest of the world, uh, the cost of um, uh, uh, processing, right, the cost of the actual chips that would be required uh, to develop uh, AI ML driven solutions has dropped precipitously, uh, and the amount of processing power that these chips have now, right, to process amounts of massive amounts of data has really taken an old concept yeah. and revolutionized it and now made it available to the average company, right? right? Where it wouldn't have been several years ago. Right. And what I love about your company is that, you know, you go, first of all, what you see when you go on to um, any type of um, of social media, or if you go on to Google and you type in AI, you have all these different companies and they're all standardized. They have a standardized program. They're pulling data from Google or, their, or and, and from the website, you know, the Google database. But your company is different. Your company works personally with specific companies, small or large, and they actually build the modules from scratch, you were telling me. And that so everything is personalized and it's built specifically for that company. So that company could actually get the best effect and, and actually benefit um, uh, in, insanely because it's not something that's just pulled from a database from Google. Your company is actually building a program that's actually going to help them grow at a, probably a quicker speed that, you know, that they, they would be able to do themselves. So absolutely. So we definitely do distinguish ourselves in the market, uh, Stacey, you know, first and foremost, right. We're, we're all familiar with um, OpenAI or ChatGPT, we're all familiar with, you know, Google, uh, what used to be Bard is now Gemini, right? Uh, we're all familiar with, uh, you know, companies like Perplexity or Anthropic, which uh, uh, has uh, their AI ML platform or generative AI platform is known as Claude. Uh, so these are very large generative pre-trained uh, transformers out there that are trained on really the 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 entire globe prompting right yeah. and putting information and training the machines and so forth like that and that's absolutely phenomenal and a lot of these systems have been designed for for, for an applications that we refer to as uh, uh CUIs right or or um, uh, 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 user interfaces, uh, right, or conversational user interfaces or chatbots and things of that nature and very applicable. But they also have their limitations. Yes. So if I'm building an AI ML solution in uh, OpenAI, for example, I can only use uh, GPT models, right. right? If there's other models out there that may be better or... Um, the desired outcome that I'm looking for, uh, I can't bring them into that environment, right? right? And that's the same for, you know, all of these large, larger companies. Plus, right, their models are trained on data sets, right, that are, again, right, that, 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 that span information across the entire globe. Right. So there are some limitations. There are some limitations. Um, we have a different approach. Essentially, what we do is that we we are we've we've built engines, right? We've built a natural language processing engine. So we start with that engine, and really, what we do is we take what we call a multimodal approach. When we look at foundation models, which are really algorithms, right? Different foundation models have um, right are, are are better for different types of required output, right? Different models are better for different types of data, whether that be video, whether that be images or text. Some models are better at producing low latency output based mm -hmm. on the input, right? So we don't want to restrict ourselves to the model that we use based on the application. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, right, that there's always new models coming out. So if we're building an application, using a particular foundation model or LLM uh, and a new model comes out tomorrow, that's better. We have the ability to use that model. The second thing that we do, right, is that we actually custom build the vector databases that ride on top of these models. 
Again, there's a lot of different vector databases out there. We take an agnostic approach using the best database that's going to result in the best output or outcome at the lowest cost. Right. And then we're building that business logic on top of it, doing the prompt engineering specifically to the use case. We believe a couple of things. Number one, because we are training on specific data, proprietary to the to the company or the organization that we're, we're building these solutions for, it's going to give a more precise, accurate answer every time because the data sets are limited to what's pertinent to the application, Right. not trained on uh, a, a, a literally a world's worth of, of data that may be relevant or may not be relevant. Yeah. The uh, second uh, thing that uh, we, we do as well is that once the solution is set up, remember there's a continuous learning process that comes in um, uh, uh, that comes into play with AIML. That uh, there needs to be continuous data feeds, right? So your information is relevant, right? right. And the machine can t- continually learn. Right? So we have a process after the fact that we are managing and monitoring for things that we call drift, right? Uh, and we are um, uh, very conscious, right, even in the building of these uh, solutions when it comes to bias, right? Bias can be conscious or unconscious. Again, uh, all of that, right, is uh, part of the determination of how accurate the output is going to be based on the the input, right? So we're agnostic across the board. We're not tied to a foundation model. Um, We're not tied to the vector databases. We're building our business logic on specific data that is pertinent or relevant to the use case and the company or organization that we're working for. But here's the other differential between us. We are also agnostic with regards to the venue of execution. So when we're building uh, our AI solutions, uh, it doesn't matter to us. If a customer currently lives or resides in AWS, we'll build it there. If it's Azure, it's there. If it's Google, right? It's fine with us as well. And even a prem-based sol- so- solution where a customer has a physical data center, physical servers, we can certainly build our solutions there as well. We're not limited to the open AI environment. Right. to the Google environment when you use Gemini and so forth. And this has long-term consequences or could. Number one, portability. If I'm building a solution in an environment that doesn't allow me to extract that mm-hmm. solution and move it somewhere else, it's called vendor lock. We see that today. A lot of companies that have migrated to the cloud, for example, yeah, they want to get the hell out. But you know what? They can't, right? They're, they're locked in that environment. Yeah. Right. So we give people uh, again, we give our our customers the ability to live for their applications to live in the best venue of of execution uh, for them as well. The second differential is that what we can do is we can put uh, price or cost predictability into place. Right. A lot of these larger gender free trade transformer, their pricing models are based on tokens. Right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like going to an arcade, right? <laughs> you know, here's 10 bucks. Let me buy a couple tokens. And a token is generally the equivalent to like three or four letters, right? So right. the larger my output and the more my, in, and the greater my input, the greater my, the greater my cost may be, mm-hmm. right? It's a little bit harder to start predicting what my future expenses will be or what my future costs will be for this application as it grows, as more and more data is being trained, right? As I want to expand the application that that I've built. Mm -hmm. There's other things like security, right? And flexibility, right? But uh, yeah, we've definitely taken a different approach, Stacey, that is, um, right? We're, We're heading down a different road than some of these larger, uh, again, general food train transformers that are already on the market. 
That's amazing. You know, one of the questions I have for you is that a lot of smaller companies don't really understand the concept of AI and how powerful it is. Like when you have AI, a lot of people just think of AI pictures, AI ads, AI content, you know, making things easier to write articles or making things easier to write a landing page or, you know, things like that. But it goes much deeper than that. And maybe you can explain, you know, what AI could actually do to a, a company, like even like a small business, you know, because I think that's where I think the larger companies have a better grasp of, of the power of AI and what it can do. But I think a lot of smaller companies that aren't, you know, they, they might be more on the creative side or they might be in the healthcare industry, but they don't understand, you know, the business end of how AI can actually change their business and give them a total three. And that's a, a great point, right? I think uh, Stacy was speaking earlier. A good part of my day is spent talking to people and to companies, right? Just about artificial intelligence. And predominantly, what we're talking about is generative AI, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the ability to take artifacts, data sets, a, a corpus of data, right? And, and train that data to generate new content. That's similar to the data that was, you know, that that was that was trained on, right? So, so the first, I guess, misconception, right, that a lot of people have, is how I can use or apply artificial intelligence, right, into my business, right? And it, the the evolution, right? We are moving at light speed mm -hmm. with the development of artificial intelligence, yes. right? Uh, but sometimes conceptually, we're, we're, we're also so far out ahead of our skis between what uh, generative AI can accomplish today and what it might be able to accomplish in, in years from now. So the first thing that we have to remember is that um, we are still in that, as far as capabilities go, right, that uh, uh, area of what we refer to as uh, narrow AI, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really the, again the beginning stages, right? You know, yeah. the, right? It, it's it, it's we're not even scratching the tip of the surface. I think Sam Altman was reading an article, right? He's the founder uh, 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 and CEO of, of uh, OpenAI. Was talking about how Chat GPT four is horrible, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right. Chat GPT five and Chat GPT six are going to be so more advanced. And I sit here and scratch my head, saying, "You guys have accomplished amazing things." I don't necessarily know if I'd be saying right that Chat GPT four is terrible. Uh, <laughs> but that being said, uh, we have a long way to go. So I usually start by saying, "But well, let's understand artificial intelligence, generative AI. Generative AI today is great. However," uh, Generative AI can only accomplish a single task that it was trained on. Right. right? Uh, AI does not have the capability of learning, right? Uh, learning uh, 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 skill sets, right? Or, or, right, take what it has learned on data that was trained. Right. And then apply it in an entirely new area, right? So sometimes I use the example, if you're into, if you're into carpentry, and you build houses, right? Mm -hmm. As a, as a human being, uh, you have to learn how do I use a hammer? How do I use a saw? Right? What what does a level do? Right? What right. right? What does a square do? And then tomorrow you decided, I want to build furniture. You don't have to be retrained on how to build furniture. You can take all of the things that you were trained on mm -hmm. in one application of building a house. Right. And intuitively, right, just apply all of those things, right, to go build yourself uh, a, 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 a table. Right? right. We're not quite there yet with AI. Yeah. Right? We, we can train data to do a, a, a singular task. Mm -hmm. But if we want that machine to do something else, now we can take the, the data that has already been trained and build, build on top of that. Right. But the machine does not have the capability. Right. To say, oh, I, I've learned this task. Let me take all of the skills or knowledge that I've acquired mm -hmm. in doing this task and just apply it somewhere else to do a new task right. without additional training or supervision. Right. Right. So there's this Skynet 
uh, uh, type of right terminator thought about AI, right? Uh, and maybe down the road, but I start by saying, look, uh, find a task especially if it is repetitive, mundane, right? Takes a human being uh, hours and hours and hours, right? Um, uh, to, to perform this singular task. Right. Let's remove the human from the loop and allow the machine to do that repetitive task. So what are we talking about? To your point, right? Maybe it's writing code. Maybe it's developing, right, you know, creating a website or creating marketing content. Uh, you know, maybe it's document reading. We're working on a project right now where our company is, uh, uh, right, they have all they have thousands and thousands of contracts out there. And they need to make sure, right, that these contracts are standard, right, that mm -hmm. uh, there's similar language. So you can have a person, as a matter of fact, they have teams of people that do nothing but read these contracts. Right. Okay. Why are you doing that? We can train a machine uh, to determine, right, the language that should be in every contract, to review every contract, right, to flag those contracts that are absent of that language mm -hmm. or identify language that may be in a contract that's dissimilar to the thousands of others that are out there. They can do it at exponential speeds of what a person can do. Yeah, And they can do it with 100% accuracy, right? Where in the IT world, we often revolve uh, or, or talk about layer eight issues. Right. Uh, that's the that's the human fat fat thumb, right? You know, <laughs> fat finger, right? Yeah. That kind of screwed something up. Mm -hmm. So just getting back to how, uh, you know, how generative AI and AI can be used in business applications, there's really no limit. But typically we like to start with a singular task that tends to be right uh, repetitive in nature, right? That you can simply replace, um, and not even replace, right? I think a better word in, in manufacturing, you hear a lot of the words cobots, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you know it's important because there's also this fear that somehow AI is going to send everybody to the unemployment line, mm -hmm. and that's not really the case at all well, uh, either. Right. But generative AI solutions are great when they work alongside of a human being. Yes. Right. To assure for accuracy, to mm -hmm. complement other jobs that a human being is doing. That's a little bit more strategic in nature. Right. And requires right. a little bit more thinking outside of the box. And it's hopefully that was uh, right. Hopefully I got to answer your question in a very long winded fashion. So I apologize no. about that. Not at all. It's good when you get details so people understand and they can, you know, really comprehend it. And and it seems like when you build from scratch and you're helping people and you're building modules to help people in their specific company, that you could actually keep building as the company elevates and the company grows. You just it just like you said, you know, the skill set change, things change. And so you just, you know, it seems like you just upgrade their their programs and, and it builds and it builds and it builds. And that way they're saving hours and they could actually focus on different areas of their business and branch out and actually maybe produce a higher income or not have to have as many people working on one specific department, like having, you know, you know, you know, a hundred people reading contracts all day, they could have maybe 50 people or 25 people, you know, or, ha you know, or have like, you know, 10 people oversight and, and looking at the red flags and so forth. That's an excellent point, right? It, it's an absolutely excellent point. We even see from the standpoint of successful projects, right? AI, AI, AI ML based projects. Um, it's always better to start with a narrow, with a very narrow specific task and build out from that. Right. A lot of the failures that we see in the deployment of AI ML are really, again, because, uh, you know, folks are trying to solve world hunger. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not really the way that we train data. Right? right. So it's better to train. Right. It's better to start training your data to accomplish a specific task and build on top of that. And that's where I think Pinnacle AI, where we kind of come to the market with really this agnostic approach from infrastructure foundation models, from vector databases, right? Uh, we really take an agnostic approach because we know that the solutions that you build today are going to evolve, yeah. right? The tasks are gonna become greater. 
there's going to be complementary tasks that need to be completed as well. Right. Right. So you want to be, you want to develop a solution that's scalable, mm -hmm. that has the ability to evolve, right? Using different types of data uh, medium, right? Video, text, voice, uh, images, right? And you don't want to be locked into a solution that provides limitations down, down, down the road. Right. Otherwise, you're going to invest a lot of time and money in something that you're that you're going to ultimately have to rip up and start again somewhere else. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think it's, I think it's very important that people understand AI and they incorporate it in their business, but do it the right way. And I like the fact that you you know you explain you know not to jump in and try to save world hunger all at once. You know, like right. baby steps. You know, you start with one small task that you know your business primarily focuses on, and then you slow, slowly build up the modules, and you slowly you are able to see the changes in your business, analyze the changes, and then you know you can see where you might be able to branch out or do things differently to evolve into a higher level it seems yeah you know Stacey I've been you know in technology one form or the other for 25 plus years right there's there's a couple things right you know whether it's AI or application development right or, or any project for that matter in the field mm -hmm. one of the greatest reasons for failure is an undefined unclear objective in right. a project in general right and then the second next biggest reason for failure is because there's not established benchmarks in that project to determine, am I heading in the right direct direction? Right. And when you don't have that clear objective, what happens very often is that companies, teams, organizations, they head down this road, right, where they, you know, they want to accomplish this thing, right, without a really defined objective. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you get frustrated. Then other priorities, or you know, come to the table, right? And people yeah. end up scrapping, you know, what they're currently doing, and they call it a they call it a failure, right? So we right. take a very granular approach, right, uh, in in the development of our solutions. I think that's very important that you do that too. And one of the questions I have, you know, is that I see a lot of large companies nowadays trying to do everything AI. And I feel yeah. that some of that is, is, is going to kind of uh, cause failure in, with certain companies. Cause I feel like I, the people still need human communication along with AI. You could have AI to help you grow and to help you complete tasks. So you're able to do other things, but I still think the communication between uh, one human professional with another human professional is important also. Even when consumers call in to, for certain companies, they have a lot of AI programs now moduled into the into the telephone and you're on the telephone for about an hour trying to get to the right. specific, you know, where you just need to ask one specific question to a human being and then you would be done with. And they're trying to get all these tasks done with AI in one phone call. And then you see very frustrated communities um, consumers, where I feel that, you know, AI is, can be such a humongous benefit, but I think, I still think companies should be aware that, that people also crave the need to also speak with another other human being. There has to be a, I think, a, a right combination too. Uh, it, absolutely. So again, here's the first misnomer that, that, that folks have, right? Um, Artificial intelligence solutions are much different than building an application, right. right? So in the application world, you come to me with a business problem, right? You say, I need this series of features um, uh, or functions in an application. I build that application for you. I turn it over to you. And whether, uh, and the reality is I never, you're never going to hear from me again, or I'm never going to hear from you again, unless that somehow there was a bug in the code that I developed, or, right? It's not working properly, or you want to expand your, 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 your feature set. From an artificial intelligence perspective, right? Especially when we're talking like generative AI, which is a subcategory. Artificial intelligence is a very broad term yeah. that, that, that covers a lot of subtopics, right? So, right, most of what everybody is experiencing today, right, is really in the field of generative AI. You are always going to require what we call human in the loop, right? You're never going to be, a, right, again, successful deployments of generative AI solutions. Understand you can never remove the person 
from the process. We're all familiar with Alexa uh, and, and Google Home, right? And we mm -hmm. think, oh, it's great. We talk to this machine and it talks back to us, <laughs> right? Uh, it's intelligent, right? We, you know, we can ask, you know, what the population of Kashmir is, right? It's just an answer. <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is that there's a team of human beings sitting behind Alexa reviewing the answers, right? right? Mm -hmm. reviewing right you know uh filling in the blanks for those answers that alexa can't provide right it's very similar to artificial intelligence there's a couple things right you know when we talk about the ethical deployment right of uh artificial intelligence right so number one when we talk about bias right Again, bias when you're building the applications can be conscious or subconscious. We all have bias. Yes. Whether we like cats or dogs, blue or yellow, right? Uh, some of that bias is conscious, but a lot of the bias is unconscious, right? So, mm -hmm. so you, right, number one, you need you need that you need that supervision to make sure that the data sources and the data that you're training is number one coming from a source that's unbiased and number two that the data is being trained in a way that is un unbiased so yeah. so to speak but after that again because artificial intelligence and machine learning is perpetual right it doesn't it, unlike the application the data sources the data feeds into the data lake where the machine is continually learning from yeah right has to be supervised for what we call drift, right? Mm -hmm. Think about the tire on your the tires on your car and right. alignment of your car. Mm -hmm. If the alignment is slightly off in your car, right, and you don't have your hands on the steering wheel, right, your car starts to drift. And you know, after a couple hundred feet, you may have drifted six inches. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But after a half a mile, you may have right you have made you you may have drifted miles off course yeah it's the same concept to drift in ai right and the only way that you can guard against drift is with people yes. right you know so you continually need that human in the loop right to make sure that the the data that you're training is accurate yes the data that the machine is learning from is accurate Right. And that the output from what is being prompted is also accurate and doesn't start to, right? And that drift of appropriate or correct answers doesn't start to deviate from what should be the outcome or the output. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Now, what makes Pinnacle AI unique compared to all these other um, AI programs that are out there? Yeah. So... When we look at a lot of our competitors and, you know, Stacey, I want to be careful. I'm just pointing out the differences. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say what we do is better. Right. right. I don't want to say what we do is right and everybody else is wrong. Right. right. But, you know, we look out in the marketplace and it is kind of novel, right? You know, that every company, right, wants to put AI after their name, right? Every product or solution is AI this, AI that, right? Yep. Um, but what's happening in the marketplace is that there's a lot of companies out there, there are a lot of organizations that what they're really doing is they're using the, 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 the pre-trained transformers from some of these large organizations like chat GPT, right. And Anthropic and, and Google, they build an API and they're using their models, um, Right, they're relying on their security. Uh, right, they're they're using their right. They have to use their 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 databases. Right, and again, here's the thing: if I'm looking for a specific answer mm -hmm. for my business, right, right. or I, I want a specific task to be accomplished, and now I have this sea of data, right, that's being trained on the right on a particular model. Yeah. Uh, the, the answer, the, the likelihood that the answers are specific to what I need start to become diminished, right? So right. the first thing is that we are, 
we, we go to market, right? Every customer, every solution that we build is unique to solving that particular problem. And the data that we are training, right, is uh, uh, is specific, right, to to that company. Right. The second thing we talked about a little bit while a while ago, right, is that there's a lot of different foundations, mm -hmm. right, and there's really a, two ways to kind of build an AIML application. One is what we call unimodal, right, mm -hmm. where you're building an application off of one foundation model, right. right? The other way, right, is a multimodal approach. Yes. A good example of multimodal approach is what we're seeing today in the new release, right, of chat GPT 4.0, right? O stands for Omni, right? Mm -hmm. And if you notice, if you go into chat GPT 4.0, where you're prompting uh, the, your requests, right, you can prompt the input can be either text, image, or voice. Yes. And the output can be the same. Right. If you went back a month ago, right, two months ago, right, whatever, right, and you wanted to create an image, you would have to go to uh, 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 OpenAI's Dolly, which is their, it was their image creator, yeah. And then if you wanted to, you know, uh, if you needed help writing an email or, 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 you know, or a paper or something like that, you'd have to switch back to chat GPT-4. Right. Now it's a, right now it's a single pane of glass. It's a single platform. Right. So, so that's using a multimodal approach. And that's really, again, uh, what we're bringing to the table. That's a big differential from, right. Yeah. From a lot of the folks out there that, Right, either are in the AI space or they say that they're in the uh, artificial intelligence space. Right, and it gets back to choosing the right model and combinations of models. Right, and then we also take a layered right. We, you know, we take a layered approach. Right, we, we we'll build model on top of model. Right, to either build out the solution or refine the solution to the desired results. So, right, um, a little bit. I guess a little bit more complex of an answer, but that's one of our main uh, distinguishing characteristics of Pinnacle AI. No, I think that's great. I, you know, I think I think people really need uh, a company where they could actually, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Say, this is my company. This is what our goals are. This is where we expect to be in the next six months or nine months or in, in the next five years. But right now, we're here. And, you know, it's, we're not growing the way we want to because we don't have the resources or we don't have the, you know, the, the expenditure, you know, cause a lot of people invest a lot of money in a lot of different things and it doesn't even get them anywhere. So, you know, if you invest in one specific thing that could, you know, help you with six, seven, 12, 20 different tasks, and then you can have less employment or you could have, and you could focus on, or have those people focus on different things. You could build a business that, you know, that will bring you to, like I mentioned earlier, higher levels and, or in higher income and, and be able to not work as hard. You know, our goal I think is to work less and make more, you know, and you know, that's everyone's dream. You know, and but you know, with AI, it could become a reality. Actually, you know, absolutely, there's no question about it. And you know, uh, Stacy, you, you hit the nail square on the head, right? Much of the heavy lifting between developing artificial intelligence solutions or generative AI solutions is really, you know, in the foundational approach, right? And what I mean by it's, what are your goals, right? What is the data that you have? What are the sources of data? What's the accuracy of that data? but not what just what your goal is today, right? What is your vision of where you want to take artificial intelligence into your business? And right now, there are companies all over the globe, right? That are paying human beings to do, again, those repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. And really what these companies are doing, they're not, right? That investment is not going into their growth, yeah. right? Right, is going on to the operational side of the ledger and it's just helping them right produce yeah right uh right what 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 their company was in, in, intended to do now if you could take those resources right you could take that cap right both both mo monetary capital and even human capital right and apply it to different areas of the business 
to help you grow, uh, it's a home run. Yeah, right? it, oh, it, sure. it's a home run. Yeah, absolutely. Hundred percent. Now, if you had to take everything that we talked about today, and you want to emphasize on some important aspects, what are some things you want the listeners to understand today about AI and about what Pinnacle AI can do for people? Yeah, great, great question. So, I, I think I'd, I'd start right with just the general understanding, right, of what generative AI can do, right? mm -hmm. and it's not so solve world hunger, at least at the at, <laughs> at least at this point, right? So understand your business, understand the, the, what, what roles and functions happen within your business mm -hmm. and understand what roles can be replaced while increasing productivity. Right. Anytime we're making a business decision, right? There, there's still some, right? There's, there's still some financial management principles or economic principles that kind of come into play, right? Understand what my return on investment is for my right. dollar. Right? If I spend a dollar today, what type of return on investment? On the other side of the ledger, right, we're talking about total cost of ownership, right? That my total loss cost of ownership for for my company providing a particular function is X. Well, how can I reduce that total cost of ownership? And then as right, as the bean counters get, you know, more complex, right, and their analysis uh and well being yeah. of a company's financial uh aspect, we start looking at things like internal rates of return and so forth like that. So again, I think understanding what the task or application it is that you want to accomplish that's either going to increase your return on investment, mm -hmm. lower your total cost of, of, of ownership, and really increase productivity and efficiency across the, you know, and across the entire organizational landscape is absolutely critical. If you're heading into a project, and you don't really know what you want to accomplish. It's just a cool thing out there called artificial yeah. intelligence. Uh, you know, and uh, right, like, oh, my God, that movie Terminator, right? Skynet took over the world. So it must be able, right, you know, mm -hmm. it must be able to, to solve all sorts of complex challenges, right, uh, yeah. in my business. Uh, you know, not not the case, right? Today, you know, at least, at least today, right? right? Uh, and there's an evolution, like I said, we are really in the beginning stages of artificial intelligence in general. Yes. Uh, uh, what we'll be hearing about, you know, probably in the short term more is what we call objective driven AI. Mm -hmm. As opposed to giving the machine a task and training it on that task, mm -hmm. we'll be giving the machine an objective and saying, go figure it out. Right. Very similar to like autonomous cars are a good example right, of objective driven AI. Right. I need to get from point A to point B. Go figure it out. There's the objective, right? Mm -hmm. Get me from one place to another, right? Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll see that form of artificial intelligence start to propagate more across the business community. Right. As we build out what the capability, you know, we go from reactive machines uh to essentially limited memory ai right theory of the mind is still just that a theory right, right? In, in many respects and certainly self-aware so right you know when we look at the latter we're still at the early you know we're still at the bottom rungs right yeah. of where this technology will will take us exactly. for good or for worse a hundred percent now yeah. With, when it comes to your services, what type of services does Pinnacle AI um, have? Because I know you have a lot of things that you do for a lot of different industries. Can you like explain some of the services that you do? Sure. So really, I'll get back to our fundamental core, core mission. We develop the proprietary and, and custom design solutions, right? You know, on from a proprietary solution, to give you an example. Pinnacle AI was really started on trying to solve a business problem, right? right? And then we've kind of expanded using generative AI, right? So the mm -hmm. business problem, you know, myself and, and and you know some of the folks, right? That 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 you know kind of started uh, Pinnacle AI, all came uh, from the hyperscalers. Yeah. All of them came from AWS, right? Uh, if I can say that, right? And we've known that there's been this business problem out there for a long time. 
couple of folks, uh, Rajiv Kamal, who's, you know, uh, founder, um, extremely intelligent guy. Uh, you know, he was at AWS and he saw the problem from the inside out. So to define that business problem, people have been making a journey to the cloud now for a very long time. Right? Yeah. And certainly that's acceleration that has been going on for a long, right, over, over, over a decade. But the business problem hasn't changed. It's only exacerbated. People make this migration to the, the proverbial cloud and nobody gets there, right? And says, man, I, I'm so happy I shut down all my data centers because I'm saving a fortune, mm -hmm. right? Generally what people find, right, is that they're just exchanging one cost for another. Right. right? And we talk about egress charges and all of these other things, right, that come yeah. with the cloud providers. But the cloud is also a lot more complex today than it was a decade ago. Right. AWS, the cloud providers have hundreds of products and services. Yeah. Right. And they've been modernizing their infrastructure as well. Right. So I could be the most, I could be the right, the most experienced cloud architect in the world. Yeah. And it's sort of like being a doctor, right? There's a lot of different medicines and treatments and and so forth like that. But who's going to know everything? Exactly. Nobody. Right, nobody. So what we've done is we started training our our machines. Right, we started training our engine on the best practices of, uh, for for standing up or building out cloud infrastructure based upon what your functional business requirements may be, what your non functional business requirements may be, what your compliance restrictions uh, may be. I need to be PCI compliant, HIPAA compliant. Right. right. And then we take a look at your, your essentially all of your cloud reporting. Right. Yeah. Cloud companies are great in one respect that they give you a lot of data mm -hmm. or bad in another respect because they give you a lot of data. There's right. no way that the average person could figure out the massive amounts of data no. right, that you can get from Azure. Or, right. Like it's like, OK. Right. <laughs> Right, like, what am I going to do with all of this information? Exactly, and that's and that's where we built the machine to essentially interpret that information, make recommendations about what products and services you should be using, right, right, it, within your from your cloud provider. Architecturally, how that should look, right? So, so we've trained uh, our machine to make the recommendations on product and services create the Visio diagrams, right? So you can put visualization behind those recommendations, do the TCO analysis. I'm spending, uh, I'm spending X today. Yeah. If I take your recommendations, what's my cost going to be uh, tomorrow? Right. The machine then also writes all of the Terraform code that would be needed yes. to make those changes within your environment. It then writes the instruction manual, right? Because mm -hmm. I have the code, right? Yeah. How do I put the pieces and the parts together? What are the best practices? Right. And then it also writes what we call a CXO playbook, right? It mm -hmm. takes the, the technical recommendations and then writes a report, right? Uh, aligning those technical recommendations to the business outcomes or the benefits that those recommendations, right? So right. essentially what it is, is there's a virtual uh, cloud architect. Mm-hmm. Right. That can, right, you know, that can obviously live within a company's cloud ecosystem environment. Yes. Make those recommendations month over month over month with uh, a, a high degree of confidence that the recommendations are accurate. Yes. Right. And as the cloud providers develop newer solutions, newer technologies, right, the machine continues to learn, right? Uh, one of the things that we've seen within, uh, you know, within the cloud environments is the, 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 the original cloud infrastructure was very similar to a physical data center, right? right. And, and really you ran your compute off of, off of a server-based infrastructure, mm -hmm. again, just like your data center. Right. Well, over recent years, the cloud companies have been innovating their environments as well. And they've started standing up compute infrastructures that we refer to as serverless based uh, uh, infrastructures, mm -hmm. where you run your workload, right? And then, 
right? Your workload drops. Right. You're not paying for that, you're, right? You're not paying for, you know, your compute instances, whether you're using them or not. You're not paying, right, uh, uh, for your, uh, right, for, 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 for your databases, whether you're using them or not, right? Right. And companies that have not modernized, that have not kept up with the modernization of the hyperscalers, we're finding that like with little effort, you can really save 25 to 35% uh, off your current cloud expenses mm -hmm. just by using the newer products and services and building that infrastructure, right? In, in a manner that aligns with best, best practices. Our last two, our last two customers that we've um, that we've essentially uh, injected their cloud reports into our transformer, we've saved both of them over sixty percent on their monthly cloud uh, on, on, on their monthly cloud costs. Right, wow. just through the modernization and selecting the right products and services. Yeah, for uh, right, really for their use case. So. Uh, again, we just believe that um, there are endless amounts of configurations uh, from an infrastructure standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, let, let's 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 leave it to the machine mm -hmm. to make a non-emotional, unbiased recommendation. Right. Of what products or services you should be using, and what that infrastructure should look like. So that's a great example of a product and a service that we built yeah. that both modernizes and optimizes, right? You yeah. know, a, a, a business system, right. right? Which essentially is, right, it's a cloud environment. Um, and then on the natural language processing side, right, again, we built an, we built an engine. We built uh, essentially the process around building out these applications. Yeah. Uh, we're able to provide a predictable cost model to mm -hmm. the end, you know, to the end user and really a path for continual growth and expansion right. of what they're what they're looking to do. And it's all customized based on that specific end user's data. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now where can people find you? Yeah. So the best place to find us, um, is either on right is some of the social platforms like um, uh, LinkedIn or YouTube. We do obviously have a web presence. So www.pinnacleai.net is one of the best places, right? You know, uh, you can certainly come to our uh, our website, look at different products and services that we offer, request demos, right? We we can actually provide demos of our natural language processing right where give me some data from your company mm -hmm. right i can train that data basically while we're on the phone together right so i can ingest right you know yeah. uh, files and as we're sitting here talking right um i can get the machine right to start um producing output about the advisor with Stacy Chillen. Right? <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, we we have developed some 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 pretty neat tools. It's the same thing, obviously. Uh, the product for cloud optimization and modernization we call Com AI. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, same thing. We built out a live demo environment where we can actually build infrastructure uh, for our right. You know, for anybody who may be interested in the product or service, right in front of them show how the machine actually works, right? And actually run through each one of those six steps between product recommendation, uh, visualization through diagram creation, TCO analysis, uh, um, uh, 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 best recommendations, right? You know, for, uh, uh, recommendation guideline for implementation, Terraform code, and actually write the, the CXO playbook, right? We can do that. And show somebody essentially how that machine works and and, and uh, evaluates uh, cloud environments. Wow, this is so amazing! This has been amazing, John. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you'll come back and we can really absolutely. Go
I would come go deeper into a conversation about AI and all the different benefits it has and how it could actually help so many businesses, so many people, you know, starting up and so many companies out there also. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Stacey, I'd like to return the thanks, right? You know, you know, we are, um, you know, we're a startup, right? And having the ability or the platform to be able to tell the world all of the exciting things that we're doing um, is, is invaluable. And the services that you're providing, right, uh, just again, in terms of allowing people to, you know, to share their experiences and their stories, again, is invaluable. So I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much. And you're very welcome. This has been an honor. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely, Stacy. You have a thank great you. day. You're welcome. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.